fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I'd like to welcome you to our study or lesson prep for Helaman chapters 1 through 6 this week. Thank you so much for joining me. The purpose of the channel is not only to give you insight into the scriptures, but also provide you with easy ways to teach those insights to other people in relevant and meaningful ways, whether that's in the classroom or with your own family. And if you're interested in lesson plans, the PowerPoint slides that I use, or the handouts that I make, please go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to those resources. I invite you to grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to go ahead and dig deep. I like to begin this lesson by talking about snakes. And uh, there are basically three types of venomous snakes in North America. Can you name them? And the answers would be rattlesnakes, coral snakes, and the cottonmouth. And yes, if you are bitten by one of these snakes, it's recommended that you get to a hospital as soon as possible to receive treatment with an antivenom. And these antivenoms are capable of countering the venom and saving your life. Now, with that in mind, why do you think a snake was chosen to represent Satan in the scriptures? Why is that a good symbol for him? Let me think about that for just a minute. My thoughts, uh, snakes are subtle. They move very smoothly and quietly. They're really, really hard to see coming. They're always low to the ground and in the dust. I think uh, it's interesting that they have a forked tongue, just like Satan, you know, saying one thing but meaning another. And the way that they attack is with venom. And that venom, once you're bitten, doesn't kill you immediately, but kills you slowly over time. So in my mind, uh, overall, a fairly good symbol. Not that I have anything personal against actual snakes. I, I think they're wonderful creatures. But I can see why they would be a good representation for the devil. Well, just a few weeks ago, I took a trip with my family up through Wyoming to see some pioneer sites, Devil's Tower, Mount Rushmore. And then we went out and spent a day in the Badlands. And near the trailhead, there was a sign that said, Beware of Rattlesnakes. And you know what? I thought to myself, oh yeah, yeah, maybe out in the distance, if you really got off trail, you might run into a rattlesnake. But, but not right here by the parking lot with all of these people everywhere. It was the heat that I was worried about. It was a really, really hot day, and so I brought lots of extra water and made sure people had hats and sunscreen. Also, there were quite a few cliffs on the hike, so I worried about my younger children navigating the trail safely. But really, snakes were the least of my concerns. So we walked down the trail about 100 yards when my seven-year-old son said, Look, Dad, a snake. And I turned around, and sure enough, Coiled in a corner, within striking distance, was a large rattlesnake. I couldn't believe it. I had walked right by it. And that close to the trailhead, I had totally missed it. I wasn't even looking for it. Now, thankfully, nobody got bit. But it could have been a real possibility being as close to the trail as it was. Case in point, sometimes the most dangerous things that we'll face in life are the things that we're not even looking for, things that we haven't prepared for. And I think that's a lot like the situation the Nephites are facing in the book of Helaman. Hypothetically speaking, if you were to stop and ask the average Nephite on the streets of Zarahemla what they considered to be the biggest threat to their well-being and safety, what do you think they would say? And Remember what we've been studying the last few weeks at the end of the book of Alma. Don't you think they'd say Lamanites? I mean, they've just come off one of the worst periods of warfare that their society has ever seen. The outward threat of war would probably be their biggest concern. And granted, in the first few chapters of Helaman, you do have some Lamanite aggression and warfare. But those problems are resolved rather quickly, and they don't really draw much of Helaman's attention. But you are going to see that by the end of the book of Helaman, it's not the Lamanites that are going to bring down Nephite society. In fact, spoiler alert, by chapter 5, the Lamanite problem is going to disappear completely. It won't even be an issue anymore. 
And we'll take a look at how and why that happens. But there are other problems, much more subtle and hard to detect, that are really going to cause the Nephites the most heartache and loss in this book. And I call these problems snake problems. They're the kinds of things that sneak up on you, that, that are harder to detect, and poison slowly by degrees. The biggest issues in our lives aren't always going to be the big, obvious, and most intimidating threats. In the book of Helaman, I see three of them. And actually, let's call this the three-headed snake of Helaman. It's these three things that are basically going to destroy Nephite society. And it's not Lamanite aggression. So first job, see if you can identify them. Go ahead and look for them in the following references. So did you find problem number one? The answer is contention. Contention amongst the Nephites themselves. Specifically, political contention. In chapter 1, they contend over who should be their next leader, because Pehoran dies. And three of Pehoran's sons are all vying for the judgment seat, and it causes three divisions among the people. Well, Pehoran II is elected by the voice of the people. But what happens? Peankai can't accept defeat. So he stirs his supporters up in rebellion against his brother. He's discovered, though, he's tried and condemned to death. Well, his supporters won't stand for that, and they have a man named Kishkuman secretly murder Pehoran. And, and that crime is eventually going to lead to our second problem that we'll talk about in just a second. But isn't that exactly how contention works? You did something to us that we didn't like, so we're going to get you back. We're going to do the same thing to you and worse. So contention leads to all sorts of issues. This division and dissension has an unfortunate consequence to it. Just take a look at 118. Because of so much difficulty in the government, they don't keep sufficient guards in the land of Zarahemla. And consequently, when they're attacked, they suffer great loss. And can you see a principle with regard to contention there? Contention and disunity make us weak, more susceptible to our enemies. As Jesus once said, and as Abraham Lincoln famously quoted, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I ask you, is this issue relevant to our day? And um, I don't wish to make any political statements here, but it's hard not to see the parallels to our own day, specifically in my own country of the United States. Contention in the government, disunity amongst the people, rebellion, hatred, infighting. These are certainly relevant issues. And you know, I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican or liberal or conservative. The problem is universal and comes from all directions. And of course, we all want to point the finger at the other side. And, and I know that many of my listeners come from other countries, and I'm sure that you see the same kinds of things. In fact, in some places in the world, that contention is played out violently and destructively. But no doubt, contention and disunity make us weak as a society, and vulnerable not only to foreign powers, but vulnerable to the spiritual powers of darkness as well. And then from a personal standpoint, we've also got contention in marriages, families, wards, schools, in the workplace. That brings weakness and vulnerability to those institutions as well. And have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen contention weaken or destroy? When my children fight and argue with each other, it just ruins the spirit of the whole house and takes away its peace. They're frustrated with each other. We get frustrated and short with them as parents. It weakens our family unity and our ability to feel the spirit. I remember having some contention with some of my companions on my mission. It made us weak and unsuccessful in our efforts to teach the gospel. I've seen contention amongst ward members hamper the effectiveness of organizations within the ward. Contention between neighbors can get ugly. It's a snake that can easily creep in and slowly poison us. Problem number two. 
Secret Combinations. Helaman 1 is such a sad chapter. It's where we witness the genesis of one of the worst problems we're going to encounter in the whole Book of Mormon. The beginnings of this secret society that aims to control and gain power through fear, bribery, deceit, and murder. And this is certainly one of those deadly snakes that slithers slowly into Nephite society to spread its deadly venom with great subtlety. Mormon is going to signal our attention to this snake directly in Helaman chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And behold, in the end of this book, ye shall see that this Gadianton did prove the overthrow, yea, almost the entire destruction of the people of Nephi. Behold, I do not mean the end of the book of Helaman, but I mean the end of the book of Nephi, from which I have taken all the account which I have written. You see, he's saying, this is the real problem here. While the Nephites were so worried about the Lamanites, this is what they really should have been focused on and worried about and preparing for. It's very hard to deal with or eliminate a problem that you can't see, that's hidden, that's secret. And the Gadianton robbers will prove to be one of the greatest hindrances to Nephite progress and righteousness for many, many years. And now, can you think of any modern-day secret combinations? That would be any group or organization that seeks to gain power over others through clandestine means and works of wickedness. So, uh, let's see, you've got organized crime, drug trafficking, human trafficking, gangs, dishonest business practices, industries that only seek to better their own prosperity at the expense of the health and well-being of others, terrorism. Secret combinations are alive and well in our society, and we've got to be on our guard to protect ourselves from them. And then on a more personal level, are there secret combinations in our lives? Things that we seek to hide from other people. Addictions, bad habits, lies, secret indulgences or relationships. They're those things that we try to keep secret from other people. It's kind of like Adam and Eve after they partook of the fruit. Satan encouraged them to hide their nakedness with fig leaves and then to go and hide from God. Now, I can't imagine that fig leaves are going to do a very good job of hiding nakedness for very long. And then it's just silly to think that we can hide from God, who is all-knowing and all-powerful. We can't hide our sins from God. Like it says in Doctrine and Covenants 1.3, And the rebellious shall be pierced with much sorrow, for their iniquities shall be spoken upon the housetops, and their secret acts shall be revealed. It's better to get those things out into the open to be dealt with, worked on, and remedied. When Adam and Eve were willing to come forward and confess their misdeeds, God was able to provide them with a better covering for their nakedness. Coats of animal skins, which would have required the sacrifice of an animal to provide that covering. And I believe that that was symbolic of Jesus Christ who would also be sacrificed in order to provide us with an adequate covering for our sins. Now, I have no idea if this was the case, but I wouldn't be surprised if the animal whose skins Adam and Eve wore was a lamb. And that would certainly fit God's symbolism, wouldn't it? Let's move on to problem number three. That one, pride and materialism. This is one of those things that you see coming up over and over again in this portion of the Book of Mormon. Sometimes it's referred to as the pride cycle. The Nephites are righteous, and therefore they begin to prosper. And once they begin to prosper, they begin to forget God and become prideful. They say, because I have more than my fellow man, I must be better than my fellow man. And it's interesting. Just look at the progression here. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says that the people were righteous except for the little pride which was in the church. Then in 3, verse 33, the word little is dropped, and now it's just the pride which began to enter into the church. Then verse 34 tells us that they are lifted up in pride. Until finally, in verse 36, we see that it's become exceedingly great pride. Did you see that slow progression there? Verse 36 highlights that truth 
when we're told that the pride did grow upon them from day to day, just like a snake slowly slithering in and poisoning by degrees. Is there evidence of this problem in our society? At least in my country, yes. Probably one of the biggest issues we face. There's a lot of pride and materialism out there. There's a great focus on things, having things, and more things than somebody else. Now, pride's going to come up again later in the book of Helaman. And so, if you don't mind, I think I'll save a larger discussion on the topic of pride for next week. It's really one of the major themes in the entire book of Helaman. But let's start to take a look at some solutions here. Remember that the scriptures will never offer us a problem without the solution being somewhere nearby. There are antivenoms to these venoms. And I'd like to point your attention to some of these. There are a couple of key words that stand out to me in these chapters. Some verbs. Things that we must do to protect ourselves from the three-headed snake. So let's try a quick activity. Here is a list of the verbs that I think are key to protecting ourselves from these vile venoms. And I'm going to scramble them up and then give you the key references where they're used. Let's see if you can unscramble these and figure out what they are. The first antivenom is to unite. And I think this represents the specific antivenom to contention. And it's demonstrated by one of Pehoran's other sons in Helaman chapter 1, verse 6. His name is Pecumeni. And so I call this the Pecumeni solution. He also wanted to obtain the judgment seat, but he loses. But how does he react? When he saw that he could not obtain the judgment seat, he did unite with the voice of the people. He didn't throw a fit. He didn't get angry. He didn't rise up in rebellion or try to find a way to secretly undermine his brother. He united with the majority and supported his new leader for the good of society. That's the kind of attitude that leads to peace and unity. If the issue is not a matter of right or wrong, but preference, or even politics, then let's strive not to become so divisive and contentious and undermining. So some examples. You're going out to eat as a family and trying to decide where to go. The majority picks Olive Garden when, when we wanted to go for Chinese. So what do we do? Do we throw a fit and complain and have a sour attitude the whole time and make everybody else's experience miserable? Or do we unite with the voice of the people and make good out of a less than ideal circumstance for us? When our boss makes a decision that we don't specifically agree with, do we talk about it behind their back and passively sabotage their plans so we can say, I told you so? Or do we unite with their voice and try our best to make it successful for the good of the company? Or when our candidate doesn't get elected, do we do everything in our power to undermine them and oppose them, so much that our goal is no longer as much about serving the good of society as it is about pulling that person down? Or do we strive to do the best we can to work with the opposition while striving to offer what we feel to be a better alternative in the next election without becoming negative, hateful, and uncooperative? It's so easy to become contentious, but it's better to be a pecumenite. Our next verb. Another thing that I can do to protect myself is to call. Call upon his holy name. Those that call upon God in sincerity are less likely to contend with others because they'll have a higher perspective of what's really important, and they're going to have a more generous and forgiving character. They won't feel the need to unite with secret combinations because they recognize that God is all-knowing and that nothing really is secret. And they won't struggle with pride so much because it takes a humble person to pray, to recognize that there's a power far higher than themselves. Next, believe. I need to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Those that have faith in Christ won't contend because they know that God will make all things just in the end. They won't need to keep things secret because they have faith in Christ's atonement 
to cover those things that Satan tempts them to hide. And they won't have pride because they'll have Christ's example of great humility to emulate. Next verb, lay hold. But what can I lay hold on? I can lay hold upon the word of God, which is quick and powerful, which shall divide asunder all the cunning and the snares and the wiles of the devil. What's the imagery there? The scriptures and the words of the prophets are like a sword. If I lay hold upon that sword, I won't be defeated. I'll cut through the lies. Or I lay hold upon the word because it will lead me in a straight and narrow course across that everlasting gulf of misery. And what's the imagery there? The scriptures and the words of the prophets are like a what? There may be two things here. An iron rod that I lay hold on to get me through the mists of darkness. Or it's a compass that's leading me. A, a liahona that guides me through the wilderness of life. I've got to lay hold on those things. And if I do, then I won't be contentious because God's word will help me to keep my priorities in order. They'll protect me from secret combinations because, like a sword, they're going to cut through the lies and the deceit. And maybe most importantly, if I'm laying hold upon the scriptures, there won't be any room in my arms to hold on to riches and things. There's an interesting use of the word hold in the book of Helaman. There's somebody out there who wants to get a hold of something of yours. It's Satan. And what does he want to get a hold of? Helaman chapter 6 verse 30. He wants to get a hold upon your hearts. If you lay hold on riches, you open up the way for Satan to get a hold of your hearts because pride and materialism and an obsession with wealth are on his side. But if you turn away from those things and lay hold on something far better, far more valuable, the word of God, then he can't reach your heart. And later in Helaman, Samuel the Lamanite tells us another problem with laying hold on riches. Helaman 13.31 They get slippery, so that you can't really hold on to them. You can't retain them. But the word of God is firm. You can hold on to it forever. So which are you going to lay hold of? Our next word from verse 35. Yield. We could have also added the words purify and sanctify also. As long as we're on the subject of hearts here, rather than allowing the devil to get a hold of my heart, I can do these three better things with it. Purify it, sanctify it, and yield it to God. In the scriptures, the heart is a symbol for our will. We can seek to gratify our own will, or we can yield our heart to God. We can say, as Jesus once did, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's the ultimate example of yielding. And that attitude will purify and sanctify our hearts. Next verb, remember. Remembering is one of the most powerful antivenoms we have at our disposal. And in chapter 5, just look for all the remembers. What things are we counseled to remember? Starting in verse 6, remember to keep the commandments. Also in verse 6, I really like this one. Remember who you're named after and live up to those names. Helaman called his sons Nephi and Lehi, and he did it for a good reason. So that every time they heard their name, they would remember them and how good they were and that their works were good. He wanted them to live up to those names. My own father believed in this principle as well, and he named me Benjamin after King Benjamin. And I hope to live up to that name. I've given my own children names of individuals that I wish for them to live up to. Caleb and Joshua from the Old Testament, Elder Holland and Seth. And even if your parents didn't give you a name like that, if you've been baptized, you've taken upon yourself the name of Christ. Now, that's a name we all strive to live up to. I love the President George Albert Smith story, where he had a dream that he met his grandfather, who he was named after. And his grandfather stopped him and asked, 
What have you done with my name? And after thinking for a while, he looked up and with confidence said, I have never done anything with your name of which you need be ashamed. I want to be able to say the same thing to King Benjamin and to Jesus as well. What else do we need to remember? Verse 9, remember the words of the prophets, like King Benjamin. Also in verse 9, remember the atonement, that it's only Christ that can redeem the world. And verse 10, remember that Christ redeems us from our sins and not in our sins. Remembering these things are going to help keep us safe from contention, secret combinations, pride, and many, many other vices. There's another remember in verse 12, but I believe that verse deserves attention all on its own. There's a different word that I want to focus on in that verse. And that verb is build. I need to remember to build something. And what do I build? My foundation upon the rock of our Redeemer. Now, I like the word build because it suggests effort and work on my part. I have to do something in order to establish myself firmly on the bedrock of Christ. What are those things that I need to do? Well, the other verbs that we just talked about are a good place to start. I think it also means to center your faith on Christ. Remember the anti nephi Lehi's who were converted unto the Lord. Those were people who built their foundation on Christ. We don't build our foundation on missionaries or other members or leaders or parents or the social structure of the church, because all of those things could possibly falter. But if I build my faith on Christ, if I center it in him, I can never fall. Christ never faileth. How else do I build upon the rock? In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ tells the parable of the wise and the foolish man. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And then he taught that the wise man represented those people that not only hear his words, but do them as well. That's another way I build on his rock. I do what he taught, not just hear it or believe it even. And 3 Nephi 18 suggests another way that I build upon the rock. Right after Jesus institutes the sacrament, he says in verse 12, And if ye shall always do these things, blessed are ye, for ye are built upon my rock. So remembering Christ through worthily partaking of the sacrament is another way that I build upon the rock. And then why can't you fall if you build your foundation on the rock of Christ? I believe that Moses 7.53 tells us why. That rock is broad as eternity. How can you fall off a rock that is broad as eternity? It's impossible. And we're going to need that firm foundation because it says that when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds and his hail and his mighty storm, not if, but when, then you won't be dragged down to the gulf of misery and endless woe. I like to show this picture when I talk about this verse. In Quebec, Canada in 1996, Heavy rains caused a nearby river to flood. Ten people were killed, and hundreds of homes were swept away. But not this little white house. For four days, the floods raged around it, wiping out everything nearby. How did it survive? It survived because it was built on a firm foundation, right on a rock. I want my faith to be like that little white house. I want to be the type of disciple that no matter what the adversary or the world throws at me, I'll stand firm. Well, as usual, a few questions that you might consider asking sometime during this lesson. When have you seen contention, secret combinations, or pride cause problems? Which of the seven verbs have you found to be the most helpful? And could you share an experience? Which of the seven verbs do you need to improve on? And how are you going to do that? Well, I wish I had better news for you here, but things don't seem to get any better for the Nephites by the end of the Book of Helaman. The three-headed snake succeeds in poisoning the majority of them. 
They were so focused on what they perceived to be the big threat, the Lamanites, that they let their guard down. The seemingly smaller things are what got them in the end. Let's not make the same mistake. Do we get so worked up and anxious about what's happening in the world or in politics or in the media that we neglect the spiritual dangers right in front of us? For many years in my youth during the Cold War, the Soviet Union was the big threat on everybody's mind, what people most feared. But that danger disappeared in the early 90s almost overnight. Really, in hindsight, it seems like the real danger during that time, the snake, was the steady decline of morality in our media and our family values. And perhaps now we worry so much about the threat of global terrorism that we've neglected to protect ourselves adequately from the dangers of technology and the rise of secularism. Do we worry so much about what's happening in the White House that we neglect to watch closely the dangers within our own house? Do we worry so much about the threat of war that we neglect the spiritual war within our own souls? You could look at this in another way, too. Are we so focused on avoiding the big sins that we ignore the smaller ones? Do we pat ourselves on the back for doing so well at living the word of wisdom and paying our tithing? that we totally ignore the fact that pride is slipping into our lives, that we're mistreating others and feeling superior to them? Are we so confident in our righteousness because we live the law of chastity and attend our church meetings that we ignore the more subtle temptations of dishonesty, ingratitude, or laziness, each of which could ultimately poison our spirits? I hope that we can keep our eyes open to all the dangers that surround us, to be prepared for the subtle temptations as well as the big ones. I hope that we can unite, call, believe, lay hold on, yield, remember, and build. Then we can enjoy the views and the beauty of our hike through the bad lands of life without suffering from the deadly bites and venom of Satan's snakes. Now, there's another antivenom spoken of in these chapters that is so key and so beautifully taught that I like to give it its own lesson or section. And it comes from chapter 5. And I usually open this lesson with a story. If you're teaching, you could relate a time when you found yourself in complete darkness. And the story that I tell is actually kind of an embarrassing one. I think I may have talked about this before, but I think it works well here. When I was in college, my roommates and I decided to go out and explore a cave system called the Nutty Putty Caves out near Utah Lake. I'd never been, and since I've always loved the outdoors, I was really excited to do this. So off we went, me trusting in my roommate who had been there before. And when we got down into the cave and started exploring a section called the maze, which should have been a red flag for me right there, we got deep down into the cave when my headlamp started to go dim, as well as one of my roommates. And of course, being the geniuses that we were, none of us had brought extra batteries or a map. So we decided to try to head back to the surface. But on the way back, we got lost and turned around, and all of our lights started to dim. So we eventually decided to stop turn off all our lights to conserve the batteries, and try to decide what we were going to do. And oh, I tell you, that was a terrible feeling, to be lost in the dark deep under the earth. I felt so stupid for allowing myself to get into that situation. And I would have given anything for more light and guidance. In a cave like that, it's pitch black. Your eyes are never going to adjust to the dark. It's just complete and total blackness. And I'm not ashamed to admit that I was afraid. Well, I think of that experience when I read Helaman chapter 5. And you can approach the story almost like a parable. Lots of symbolic meaning here dealing with light and dark. And I think the most important thing you can do as a teacher here is to help your students visualize the story and liken it to themselves. And, and really, the only way to do this story justice, I think, is to go verse by verse. 
I'll also often call a student up to be an artist for the class and to illustrate the story as we go. And, and I tell them that, that just stick figures are fine. But, but have them draw some of the major elements of the story on the board for the class to consider. So I start by dividing the board into three sections. Or you could give them a handout that I'll make available to you. And at the top of section one, I write when. At the top of section two, if. And at the top of section three, then. And explain that as you read the story, that you're going to fill them in as we go. And we're going to divide the story up into three sections as well. 5, 22 through 28, 29 through 42, and 43 through 50. So our first section is going to establish our when. So as you read, keep these questions in mind. How would you describe the state of Nephi and Lehi in this section? And how would you describe the state of the Lamanites in this section? Now, I'm not going to take you verse by verse because I'm going to assume that you've already done that or that you're going to do that now. But let's see if you noticed anything. First of all, Nephi and Lehi. True, they begin trapped, hungry, and in peril. But as soon as verse 23 begins, that all changes. They're encircled about with fire, but not burned. So visualize that. These two figures in the prison surrounded by this glorious light and fire and warmth. And how does it make them feel? It gives them courage. The Lamanites, on the other hand, what happens to them? They're overshadowed by darkness. And that darkness makes them feel what? Fear. And I'm going to cheat a little bit and steal another word from the next section in verse 34. And there we learn that the darkness is so thick, it's so overpowering, that it makes them immovable. They're trapped. They're paralyzed there. Now have your artist draw a representation of that. And here's how it might look. At this point, I might ask if they feel if this teaches them something visually. Light and fire are almost always symbols for the Spirit, the Gospel, righteousness, all the good qualities of fire. Warmth, light, comfort, but none of the negative. It doesn't destroy, it doesn't burn them. And that light gives them courage. They're protected from their enemies. The Lamanites, on the other hand, are plunged into darkness. And that darkness brings a different emotion, fear. I think that we can all relate to that. Darkness brings fear and traps us, impedes our progress, paralyzes us in place. And the Spirit whispers to us, do you get the point? Are you listening with your spiritual ears? This is a physical, visual representation of their inner spiritual states. Righteous Nephi and Lehi, surrounded with light and warmth and protection, filling them with courage. That's what righteousness brings. We sometimes sing a primary song, Teach Me to Walk in the Light. And then we also sing a hymn, The Spirit of God like a fire is burning. The darkness of sin and unbelief and ignorance and hatred fills us with fear. Fear of what? Fear of consequences. Fear that there's no purpose. Fear that people are going to discover our sins. Fear of death. Fear that it might not be true. Lots of awful, solemn fear comes from being in that darkness. So on our chart, Let's write this. When we are in darkness, and that darkness can represent all those things that we just mentioned, sin, unbelief, hatred, etc. Now, the rest of the story is going to teach us how to get out of the darkness. What have we got to do to remove darkness from our lives? Now you have someone read section two, while the rest look for and mark all the answers to that question. And what have we got to do? Verse 29, as well as other verses, repent. Verse 30, listen to the voice. And here we have a beautiful description of the voice of God, or the Spirit. Sometimes we portray God with a deep, bellowing voice. But here we find that it was not a voice of thunder, or of great, tumultuous noise, 
but a still voice of perfect mildness, like a whisper. Yet it pierces to the soul. So it's powerful, but calm. And then I love this next scene. Talk about a visual. There they are in the darkness, trapped. And one man by the name of Aminadab turns around and he sees something cutting through the darkness. What is it that has power to pierce the darkness of sin and fear? He sees the faces of Nephi and Lehi shining through the clouds. And then what does Aminadab tell the others they need to do in the darkness? Turn and look. Look at the faces of the prophets. And they do. Now they're still in the midst of darkness, but at least they can see something. And what are the faces of Nephi and Lehi doing? They're looking up, speaking with some being above them. Visually, what have we just learned about the prophets? Prophets are full of light. Turning away from the world and looking to them will shine that light into our lives. And who do the prophets speak to? God. And God speaks to them. Now, what is the most natural thing to do when you see somebody looking up? Well, you look up also. In fact, there's a fun prank that you can try if you want to test this out for yourselves. Get a group of people together and stand outside looking up and point at the sky and say, can you see it? Yeah, that's amazing. I totally see it. And then wait for other people to walk by. And what's going to happen is that they're going to stop and they're automatically going to look up as well. They, they won't be able to help it. And they'll ask, what? What is it? And you just keep pointing and saying that, that thing up there. Wait for more and more people to arrive and, and pretty soon you can slip away while all of them are standing and pointing. Anyway, the point is, when somebody looks up, it causes us to look up also. Looking to the prophets is going to lead us to God as well. In verse 40, they ask what they need to do to remove the cloud of darkness from them. Verse 41, repent, cry unto the voice, even until you shall have faith in Christ, who was taught unto you by Alma and Amulek and Zeezrom. So again, that idea is emphasized. Look to the words and the teachings of the prophets. So back to our chart. When we find ourselves in darkness, we must repent and cry unto God. But above all, in this story at least, we must look to the shining faces of God's servants. We've got to believe in their words, look to their example, and trust in their connection with heaven. And that's going to connect us with heaven too. And if we do, our last section here, let's read these last verses looking for the results of focusing and turning to the faces of the prophets in our darkness. Verse 43, the darkness was dispersed. But not only that, it's not just that the darkness goes away. They too are encircled about every soul with fire. That same fire that surrounded Nephi and Lehi is surrounding them too. And how does it make them feel? It's not awful solemn fear anymore, but joy, glory. The Holy Spirit fills their hearts. They feel peace. Angels come and minister to them. And now they aren't paralyzed anymore but they're energized and mobilized. Now they go forth teaching and preaching the gospel to all around them. And you know what? They teach so powerfully that the entire Lamanite nation is converted. It's a wonderful story. In fact, we're not going to spend much time in chapter 6, but you see this marvelous role reversal where the Lamanites now become more and more righteous while the Nephites slip further and further into wickedness. So can you see the principle of the story here? Can you see our final antivenom? We could add another word to our list. That word would be look. Look to the prophets. Their words, their leadership, their examples shine through the clouds 
of a dark world. And looking to them is going to lead us out of that darkness and into the same light that they enjoy if we choose to follow them. Now our picture can look like this. A wonderful visual lesson. So now I'd like to ask you a question. Is that principle true for you? When has looking to the prophets brought light and peace and joy and the Spirit into your life? For me personally, I can think of many times in my life where the counsels of a prophet have gotten me through a dark time, but I'll just give you one example. When I was a teenager, I was going through what I perceived to be a dark time in my life, feeling a little lost, afraid, and immovable. And I remember attending a priesthood session in the tabernacle and hearing Gordon B. Hinckley give a talk. And that talk caught my attention because he, he started by telling some sports stories where famous professional ball players were remembered for dropping the ball. And then he encouraged us as young men not to drop the ball spiritually, but to play well for the Lord's team and live a pure, cleaner, more Christ-centered life. Well, I left the tabernacle that night with a newfound enthusiasm and purpose. I wanted to be a young man that didn't drop the ball. So looking to his face brought me out of the darkness and into the light. That light gave me courage. It gave me joy. It gave me peace. And I would hope that you could all think of times when the words of the prophets helped you out of darkness. Well, we're so fortunate as members of the church to be led by living prophets. I think that we could all agree that we live in dark times. Sometimes, I think it's easier for members of the church to get frustrated with political leaders because just look who we have to compare them to. We're spoiled with such amazing leadership in the church. This chapter reminds me of a promise that's found in Doctrine and Covenants 21, verses 4 through 6. Wherefore, meaning the church, thou shalt give heed unto all his, the prophets, words and commandments which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me. For his word ye shall receive as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith. For by doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, and the Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before you and cause the heavens to shake for your good and his name's glory. I'd like to conclude my story of being in the cave. As we sat there in the darkness, we decided as a group that we should pray for help to know what to do. We decided to call, call upon God for help. And I was chosen to offer that prayer. And I know that not all prayers are answered in this way, but I'm not making this up. As soon as I said amen, we heard other voices in the cave. We shouted to those voices for help until we finally met up with another group. And embarrassingly, it was a troop of Cub Scouts. <laughs> and they had extra batteries. They had brought a map and they knew the right direction to the exit to the cave. So that's the time that I was rescued by the Cub Scouts. But I can't tell you how good it felt to see a light coming our direction out of the darkness. How good it felt to exit the cave and stand in the warm, brilliant light of day. That's what it's like to look to the prophets after a time of darkness in your life. I love the living prophets. Can you think of a greater group of men anywhere in the world? And you know what? They really do shine. When I hear them speak, I can tell. I can sense their connection with heaven. In fact, they almost do seem to shine literally as they speak. I invite you, like Aminadab, to turn and look to them in your times of darkness. And then just hang on until the comforting, courage-inspiring flames of the Spirit surround and protect you. And that's my prayer for all of us. And that's all I have for you this week. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please share it with somebody that you feel it could help. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, I hope you do that. And 
hit the like button if you enjoyed it too. That helps the channel to uh, be seen by more people. So thank you so much for watching, and as always, get out there and teach with power.